But this is fun. Um, I'm happy to leave this off, actually. Uh, let's go back. Get F5. Oh, or okay, that is it. Bring it back in here. These are my notes. I'm just going to read this point in here. And then we go up and down. When it's running. Yeah. yeah, when it's running, then you need to uh, in the, I think it's mainly in the, in this kind of. What's that? But you, you, you would need to switch between parts. Could I have to plug something in red? Yes. Like a USB in thing in red? The USB thing is uh, Unless Jim has taken it with him. Sure. Yeah, I will unlock. Does your laptop help a little bit? How's that? Okay, it should be fine. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. One, two, one. Hi, I, our next speaker is uh, Karam Birsing from uh, the CentOS project. He's the project lead and he's working in, uh, at Red Hat. Um, he will be talking about um, open source focus on the user end and how CentOS fits in. Karam Bir. Thanks. <laughs> Should I leave? Is my talk done? Um, so hi guys, um, my name is Karan Beer. Everybody knows me as KB. Um, I don't have a lot of slides, but I thought green looks like a nice color, right? It compliments. Because even I'm looking at green and you guys are also looking at green now. Um, so is there anybody here who doesn't know about CentOS? Uh, you don't count, you're wearing a shirt. Um, okay. So what, what, what do you know about CentOS? Okay, sounds good. But so you you would actually add Red Hat. Okay. So I think uh, there's uh, 
there's, there's basically two different takes on CentOS, right? CentOS the thing and CentOS the bigger word CentOS, right? And, and I always like to make sure that there's clarity on what, what we mean and where we're going with it. So on one hand, you have the CentOS Linux distribution, which is built from uh, sources of Red Hat Enterprise Linux that is released publicly or whatever. And that's CentOS Linux. But there is this other thing called CentOS, which is the CentOS project. Um, and amongst other things, one of the things that we do is build and release the CentOS Linux distribution. There's a lot of other stuff that also happens on the edges, a lot of things that happen in the community space and a lot of you know, engagement opportunities and things like that. And I think it's easy to miss that part of it because there's a very big expectation in open source about everything being about open source. It's kind of hard to look past the fact that you can have communities of users. And it's very easy to look past the fact that, look, this guy doesn't write code. How can he possibly be a part of a community, right? Um, how many people here think of open source as being a disruptor versus how many people here think that open source is the new normal? Okay, so, so when we say open source projects, what we're really talking about now is modern day software processes, software projects, right? It's no longer, it's not going about, you know, the one hipster guy in a room full of 700 who writes open source. It's pretty much expected that most innovation that happens these days, most new cool stuff that is coming out is open source anyway, right? Um, now, there's, in, my, in my opinion, there's, there's four key aspects to any software project, right? Um, the first part of it, the first key part of it, and I think the most important part of it is that at the end of the day, it is still about software. So if you're writing software, it should ideally be good software. It should ideally be software that solves a problem. It should be a software that people actually want to use, right? If you're writing software for yourself, you're not really doing a lot for, you know, you're not really doing a lot in the community space anyway, especially if you're not going to give it away or if you're not going to, you know, open source it or whatever. So step one, uh, and I think the most important part of being in a successful um, software process as such is to have a piece of code, a piece of software that actually solves a real problem, right? So that's one part of it. The second part of um, a software process, especially for more relevant software processes and software projects, is that you need to have a responsive maintainer group. Uh, it, could be, it could be the authors, it could be the people who help the authors of the software, it could be the documentation people, it could be curators in the community, whatever. I mean, whoever you call the maintainers need to be responsive. If people come up with a request, there should be somebody they can point the request at, or if they come up with a, you know, a bug report or a feature request, there should be somebody there who can take that on and then talk to them about what it is that they need, what it is that they want, where they want to go with it. And you know, that becomes, again, a key part of, you know, the, the, sort of the first wrapper on top of the onion, right? Um, figuratively speaking. You've got the core, you've got the onion, and then the first wrapper really is to have a really good, uh, you know, a responsive maintainer group, right? Um, the third piece of the puzzle that is important, right, for any relevant software product and a software process is that you need to have uh, a community that you can address. And when you address that community, a key metric you need to be able to communicate into that community is a confidence of continuity. Right? If somebody's going to come in and talk to you about, hey, you know, uh, you've written this great lib that I can use to make my files smaller. Right? I'm going to invest with you, I'm going to write my software using your particular software. Right? He needs to have, he or she needs to have the confidence that by investing in your setup or by building something on top of your setup, they have some level of assurance of continuity. It shouldn't be, you know, hey, I wrote this piece of code back in 1997, here it is, throw it up, and I'll see you in 20 years' time. Right? So, so there needs to be that confidence. You see what I mean? Right? There needs to be that confidence that you have the code, which is doing relevant stuff. Is that me? Is something moving? Okay. Let's try that. Um, so you have, you have the code, right, which hopefully, hopefully solves the problem, and it solves the problem in a space that people want to consume that software. And then you build up a great maintainer relationship between that, between the community and, and the product or the process or whatever it may be. Um, and the third part of it is then you want to be able to communicate into your community some level of confidence. And, and, and it comes in many ways, right? They should be confident that your software, if it has vulnerabilities, will get patched. Um, if they, if they um, have an objection to, assume you have an IRC channel and some guy is being, is being really awkward and he's you know, being a pain or whatever. They should have confidence in being able to approach the maintainer group, and the maintainer group should then have a process or whatever that they can address some of these issues. Even if it may be, even if your process is, we'll think about it. Even if the process is, we'll see what we'll do on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not saying you need to go away 
and every software project needs to have a whole set of governance rules or whatever. But there needs to be something in there. And then finally, you need to be able to communicate a sense of continuity, that there is, there is a reasonable effort that is going to go into this particular piece of software. We are going to keep it going. And in many cases, like especially, I, I'm guessing a lot of people in the room are, you know, are, are actually working for Red Hat. And in many cases, and increasingly so, especially stuff coming out of the Western world, increasingly software processes and software projects are backed by vendors where there's money involved. People are not doing this as, you know, hey, this is what I did after my dinner on Friday night and before I went to bed, right? This is actually people working on software from Monday to Friday. And which means there's more structure to the whole process. There's more organization around it. There is ways and means that um, you can address resources and stuff. But that confidence for continuity still is something that has to be communicated into the user base, right? Does that kind of make sense? Is there anything there that somebody wants to talk about? No? OK. So the fourth critical piece of any software process is that uh, it's nice to have users. You know, you can write you can write the best possible software that you want, and you can have a really good responsive maintainer uh, group, right? You can have all of the interfaces set up. You can have really good communication. You can do whatever you want. People can feel confident about the continuity of your piece of software. But at the end of the day, you still need users, right? Um, now this gets slightly sorted with the same with the same argument that I made like a minute ago that increasingly open source processes in open source softwares are backed by vendors right and and you could potentially argue that the upstream downstream relationship has kind of eroded from the user space contributor space to being the project upstreams and then the user space actually being the product users and the product consumers not so much as the software process itself so it could be, hey, I developed the software in open source. It's on GitHub. Fantastic, come join me. Um, and if you want my binaries, have your credit card number ready and call 0800 mynewdatabase.com. Right? And, and that's fine, because that fits into the paradigm of open source software. If somebody else wants to go and kind of create interfaces in there, somebody else wants to go create a forum or an IRC channel or whatever, they're welcome to do that. Right? How welcoming those external interfaces to your product or to your process are going to be within the upstreams of the process is again a key metric that people will look at if they try and, you know, if they're trying to figure out how confident am I that this software is going to exist in six months time? How confident am I that if I invest building my storage solution on this particular piece of software, it's still going to be relevant in, in, in a year's time or two years' time or whatever? So you still, in spite of the vendor engagement, you still need to build those bridges. You still need to have those confident loops that you kind of communicate through. And in that case, the user space changes a little bit, but you still need users, right? There's no point in writing software that nobody's going to use. I mean, you could potentially argue that there is a lot of point in writing software that you want to use yourself, right? In that case, you are the user, you are the maintainer, you are the contributor, and then it's up to you to figure out how you want to use it, how you're going to how you're going to deploy it, like years from now, whatever, and if that even means anything to you or not. Um, but in most cases. Um, I don't know if anybody here disagrees with me. It's nice to have that second user, you know, somebody who uses your software that isn't somebody who also writes the software. Is that, is that a reasonable assumption? Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and, um, and what happens is that in many cases, it becomes hard for an open source project to take the first step, right? How do you announce what you're doing? So you can, you can, take, you can take your content, you can go to a conference. Um, you can find, if you're into storage technologies, you can find a storage conference, you can go there, you can tell everybody about this great thing you've got. Um, you might get some traction there, you can get, you know, journalists to write about what you're doing. Um, you can do a couple of interviews, you can, you know, set up some sort of a viral Facebook campaign or a Twitter campaign, you know, of monkeys jumping out of a car while they deploy your storage solution, right? And then you hope that that creates a funnel that on ramps into, so, so you can do all sorts of various things, right? Um, so this is, this is where I think CentOS kind of fits in. Because there is a certain demographic uh, of users who invested very heavily on CentOS, right, for whatever they were doing over the years, over the last 10 to 12 years that, that we've been around. Um, and, it's a, it's a, and it's a very specific kind of a user base in that, um, firstly, it is distinctly a user base. There are very few developers who just consume CentOS and participate in the community process. There are a lot of developers who use CentOS to do different things, interesting things, but they go typically go and do it in different environments, right? So again, staying with our, with our storage um, examples, there are a lot of people who build storage solutions on CentOS, but they typically go and do it on their own, in their own space, and et cetera, and that's fine. That's a part of the open source process, right? But the people who engage with us, the community space around CentOS is very, very, very heavily user-influenced. And in that space, it's very, very, very heavily um, skewed towards the operations, towards the sysadmin, towards the infrastructure side of things. 
And we do have desktop users. I think um, one metric that we dug out was uh, there was a critical Firefox update. And we said, if we can find out how many people download that update, we can probably try and work out some metrics on how many or what percentage of the CentOS user base is actually running Firefox, therefore desktop users. And I think the number we came up with last year in late summer was about 18%. So about 18% of CentOS users use Firefox, which is interesting, which is a lot more than what I thought it was going to be. But the other metric in there is that what are the other 72% of the people doing? Or of the 82%, 80%, yeah, of, of, uh, of the user base. And, 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 and that kind of reflects on the skew that is there in the community space. And that cascades down to people who are on IRC channels, people who are on the mailing list, people who engage with us, people who come and talk to us at conferences, people we go and talk to in conferences and things like that. And, that. and then that presents a great opportunity for other projects who see an audience. Let's try that. I think there's probably a loose cable somewhere. Okay. Wow. This has suddenly gone into a stereo sound or something. Maybe you can try moving it down a bit. Let me try this. And the mic is away from me. Is that better? Maybe. It needs more user testing, right? So yeah, so, so on the center side of things, there's a massive skew towards infrastructure projects and towards sysadmins and operations people and stuff like that. But what also happens is that there are certain values that people can derive from CentOS Linux, right? Which is what makes the RHEL equation so interesting. Um, there are some big companies who have invested very heavily on CentOS because they want a user land that they can predict, but they don't want to use the kernel in CentOS. They're on their own mainline kernels. There are other people who don't want to use a Ruby stack in CentOS. They want to do their own Ruby stack. And at CentOS is a great place to come and do this because there's no support, right? You get, you get the agony aunt kind of support. You know, you can go to a mailing list and say, oh man, my system broke. And everybody will be like, oh, very sorry to hear that. I mean, beyond that, there's very little in terms of SLA support you can get. But what you do get is you get a community of users. And sometimes that can be dangerous. Like the other day, there was somebody, there was a big service outage on the internet and they had a LVM issue. And, and they were complaining. And all of the advice they were getting was, have you tried ButterFS? Have you tried ZFS? And he's like, look, I've got eight years of having used X3 with LVM. I am not going to go away and now deploy ButterFS or whatever. So, so community support can be, can be kind of like useful as well, but it can also be kind of weird um, because everybody has their own opinions. But beyond that, if you know what you're doing and if you're in a space where you want to own a particular piece, then CentOS is a great place to do it because the rest of the environment around CentOS doesn't change which is effectively what the RHEL proposition is, that deploy today, and four years, five years from now, you'll probably have the same version of Ruby. You'll also have the same version of the kernel and the same version of Python. So if you now want to go and tweak one piece, you can then own that piece and only own that piece, right? Which tends to be a really great place to be if you, if you want to build a user story around a particular piece. Um, and what we've been doing on the CentOS side, uh, and I think you would have, if, if you guys were in Fabian Stock, Brian Stock, Jim Stock as well, you'll see, that what we've done exceedingly in the last sort of two years, and hopefully some part of it we're doing well, is that we've gone out and we've extended the ecosystem around the RHEL code base. So we are building for architectures which RHEL doesn't support directly, like, like ARM v7, ARM v8. We have a 32-bit build for, for EL7, the, the code base itself. There's some stuff happening now on Power64 Power and Power64LE. Um, there's been somebody talking about MIPS as well. And, and, and what that really does is that it expands the scope of where you can now take your, your project, right? Um, now, within having said all of that stuff, what, what we try and do is we try and curate an environment, right, that takes away the pains of engaging with the community from, from the upstream projects itself. Again, staying within the storage paradigm, if you were to take somebody like GlusterFS or Ceph, they already have mechanics in place that allows them to build, test, and deliver, right? They already have ecosystems that rely on them. For example, the OpenStack environment is very sort of wired in with the Ceph area, or what's Ceph doing? is kind of interesting to what's happening in the open stack areas. Similarly, what Gluster is doing is very interesting to other projects like, you know, people who do cloud stuff um, in EC2. There's a lot of Gluster in there, and um, people like Overt consume Gluster. And so there's a, there's a lot of engagement there already. And then the end users who consume a lot of this stuff already have upstream engagements as well. So what we're really trying to do from the CentOS project side of things is that we have the base, we have the users, and people who now want to go away and now think about storage 
they should have an easy on-ramp, like maybe two steps, to be able to deploy a storage solution. And that is effectively what we're trying to curate on this side, is that don't change your developer experience, don't change your you know, bug triage or your patch or your, you know, your vendor engagement or your uh, maintainer engagement, but work with us to help bring your product or your project down to the CentOS user base to make it trivial for people to experiment with code um, and make it trivial for people to actually consume the products and stuff that you're shipping out. Does that kind of make sense? Again, if, if anybody wants to talk about stuff, feel free to just, uh, just shout out at me. I'm, I'm happy to talk about stuff as and when. Okay, so. Um, I think the cable is probably. Is it? Yeah. Okay, but it which end? This end or the other end? Okay, I'm happy to do that. Let me reach into my back pocket. Hello. Is it on already? Okay. This is good. Now I don't have to listen to myself in 3D audio anymore. How's that? Hello. Hello. Yes, no. There's a light on. Huh? So I wonder what the real time kernel story is. We probably need we need a faster boot setup on this, right? Um yeah, so, so if anybody wants to talk about stuff, you know, feel free to reach out. And, and again, going back to um, typical open source projects, right, we'll, we'll, have, um, we'll have the workflow already in place. You have, so you have your source control stuff, you have your build mechanics, you'll have your test mechanics, whatever they are, and then you have a delivery mechanics. And, and what we try and do, Brian uh, touched on this briefly, is try and provide a really great build environment, try and provide a comprehensive test environment. How you use it, of course, is up to you. But we try and provide as many options as we possibly can in that test environment. And then we try and provide as many delivery mechanisms as we possibly can. And then try and provide some sort of user engagement beyond that product and process as well. Um, I'll, I've got a couple of slides. Let me see if I can get that on. And then we can try and. Uh Okay, so there's a lot of stuff on that screen. Um, but Brian kind of touched up, touched briefly on the, on the chunk of what this is, right? So typical open source projects will have, um, will have the build test release stuff. So what I'm, and, th and this is sort of what we have in place right now. We have, we have an environment that people can build in, we can test in and deliver from, right? And then there's the whole feedback loops and stuff. So I'll just quickly try and see if we can walk through what that typically looks like in one implementation, right? Um, and it's something that isn't there yet. We were talking about it yesterday on the container pipeline side of things. Um, so what we're doing is we're trying to build an environment that allows any project, whether you are already engaged with CentOS or not, to come and build their container story with us. So if you want to get into containers, then if you want to do it as a project, and now if you want to deliver it to an existing user base, the easiest way to do it is to actually find somebody who knows what they're doing, learn everything there is to learn about containers, and then try and build your own story, right? And you may or may not get any traction. So what we're trying to do is take that pain away. So you have a GitHub repository, and we'll just take that from you and build your container story for you. So what that typically means is you, there's an input process, right, which comes in from whatever. And in this case, I think we've got uh, the upstreams, which is just a Git repository somewhere. And you could be a project anyway. You don't have to be engaged with CentOS at this moment in time. Um, or you could be using the Atomic Developer Bundle. Does anybody know what the Atomic Developer Bundle is, the ADB box? OK. This, this, yeah, OK. Not a lot. So you should go look it up. It's, it's quite fun. Especially if you're getting started with containers, it's a good place to start from. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take the input that you're pushing through, we'll build it through uh, something called the container index, right? It's an easy thing to get into. There's a, it's, a, it's literally a GitHub repository. You clone it, add in your details, request to merge, and that gets merged in. And literally, that's the only interface that you'll have with the entire system. You don't have to sign a CLA. You don't have to get involved with legal stuff. You don't have to sign up for an account or any of that kind of stuff. Anybody can join in. There are two constraints, though. Um, 
the software has to be distributable and redistributable because the entire build is public. All of the stuff that happens in through the process is public. So you have to be okay with that, right? The second part of it is that if you're using any custom tool chain or if you're using any binary blobs, then you have to have the ability to distribute and redistribute. So for example, we welcome NVIDIA's binary blobs or firmware stuff if you want, for example. But you just need to have that conversation with NVIDIA to make sure that they're okay with you distributing it, not us, right? That, that, that onus of ownership of the code is up to you to kind of figure it out. Um, then we provide mechanics in place for people to test that kind of environment. So you do the build, the container gets built or the source gets built, you push it into a test environment. Um, and the tests can either be user relevant tests or they could be, um, what am I talking about here? They could be imported payloads. So you could, you, could, you could set up your own scaffolding, you could do your unit tests, you could do functional tests, you could do integration tests. You could set up your tests to rely on other projects as well. And it's all fairly simple to integrate in, right? The mechanics for this already exist. And then based on your test environment, if you want a feedback loop that says, hey, you know, something happened or something broke, then, then you can go back and you can iterate, build test, build test, till such time as you're happy to um, kind of move that forward. Now, the key part of this, and I, and I go back to it a few times, is that there is no user interface for you to engage with. So how you get your project in is by sending in the GitHub pull request. And all of the feedback that you get is based on an email address that you give us. There is no web interface that you can go to, there's no account to sign up to, there's none of that kind of stuff. So if you're working in a vendor environment, basically it's, it's, it's key there that there's no agreement to sign to use any other stuff. Now when you're ready to release, we have a couple of ways that you can release stuff into, right? Which is where we do the validation stuff. Um, and on the container pipeline, this is how we're implementing it. So we've got an OpenShift Origins instance that should be up, I think, in the next couple of weeks. I think end of Feb is the target to having that up. What we do have right now is we have CentOS Linux running in native hosts that you can deploy Docker Kubernetes into, do your validation and all of that stuff. Um, we've got, I think we've got a dozen odd machines running or VMs running CentOS Atomic Host. So you can do your validation in there as well to make sure that things work, CentOS host, CentOS Atomic host. And then we also have an on-prem story which at this moment in time, we're trying to figure out, it's going to be OpenStack. I think Brian touched on this as well a little bit, that OpenStack instance is not up yet. So how we're doing the on-prem story right now is by using public cloud instances. So we have a slice in rack space that we can deploy 30, 40, 50 VMs into and tear them down all the time. And then we have a much larger chunk of uh, infrastructure in EC2, which is again sponsored by Amazon. Um, and we can do validation in that place, which also means that you can validate on just a generic image or you could validate inside the uh, Elastic Container Service if you, if you wanted to, if you so wanted to. But longer term, our plan is to take that off, bring it all in-house, run um, OpenStack within the CentOS infrastructure and then let you kind of test against that. Um, another key part of the testing infrastructure or the validation infrastructure over here is that we give you access to the resources backing it, right? Um, and what that basically means is that if you want to deploy your own OpenStack, you can do that as well. There are mechanics in place that let you deploy your own OpenStack across a couple of nodes and then do your validation. If, if that is what is what you want to be validating, right? If you want to be consuming OpenStack as a, through an API, we can give you the whatever APIs you need. So if you need Glance access, we can give you that. If you want Swift access, we can give you that. If you want Horizon access, we can give you that. Or if you want to abstract it away, we have a very thin um, layer called Duffy, which can't do OpenStack yet, it can do bare metal, but we hope that you know soon it'll be able to do OpenStack instances as well. Um, then moving on, what we do is that we do validation across, I kind of briefly touched on this anyway. So we have bare metal, right? All of that stuff gets validated there. It gets validated in a virtual environment, like whatever, if you're running, for example, in OpenShift or if you're running in containers. And we do it in vendor clouds. So things like EC2, Rackspace, um, and I think there's uh, 62 different vendors who participate in the CentOS instance sake. And we validate across all of them if you want to. So you could go and validate, for example, against ByteMark. Um, Linode and DigitalOcean, unfortunately, are not there yet. If anybody here knows anybody there who can help open those conversations up, that would be quite cool. Um, but there are 62 vendors that, uh, that are participating in the space. And, you know, and what we do is that because you're a part of the CentOS ecosystem, because you're building with us and you're testing with us, we let you use our credentials into those environments to validate content for those environments, if that makes sense. So, so basically, for, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. One of the things that we're doing with OpenShift is that OpenShift is building, or will, is soon going to be building, um, their entire content, OpenShift Origins, into CentOS. And then we will bring up an instance of that within CentOS itself, and that's slated to happen by the end of February. But what we're also going to do is we're going to put OpenShift inside VMs and then use the CentOS Amazon Marketplace to expose OpenShift through the Amazon Marketplace instance. Similarly, use the Google Compute Marketplace instance and the, you know, and, and without going into names, 
the 62, right? So let's, let's stick with that number. Um, so there's 62 different environments that we can then expose that particular content payload into. So if you're in the storage business, and if that is interesting, then you don't have to go build those relationships. You can consume the relationships that CentOS already has in place as a project and exploit those for, for whatever the uh, requirements might be. Like one of the things that we're working quite hard on right now is Atomic Host. Um, how many people here know about Atomic Host? Not a lot. You should, you should all, the rest of you should all kind of start reading news media. Um, well, Atomic Host, in a, in a, in a brief, in a, in a, in a very brief uh, kind of way, is a different way of looking at a distribution where you can't install and remove packages. You get a complete baseline that you live with, and then you do an upgrade every six weeks to four weeks or whatever, and the only way to get the upgrades in is to reboot. And, and the primary, the driver there being that you don't, you don't install and remove apps. You install and remove containers or payloads, and then you join larger clusters, et cetera. So it's, it's a different way of looking at distributions, but it's a great way to run containers. Um, and what we're basically working on right now is to enable those 62 vendors to ship CentOS hosted Atomic Host to all of the people who want to consume Atomic Host in their environments. Um, and we've had mixed results because like in this audience, I'd say half of the people know what, what Atomic Host is. And that's the same problem we have in hosting or in vendor space, that a lot of them are, but what's wrong with just CentOS? And we're like, well, nothing's wrong with it. You can still do it there. This is just a different way of looking at it. And it's better in certain ways, and it's worse in certain ways. Um, but now what happens is if you're a special interest group or if you're building with us, you get interfaces into that environment as well, right? Without having to build those relationships. And I think that's a key part of the value proposition of engaging in the user space. That a lot of these guys are not talking to developers. Like EC2 has a developer paradigm, right? But EC2 is in business because of the users who come to consume EC2 services. Similarly with Rackspace, right? Rackspace has developer interfaces. But their primary interface to the world is the user side of things. And that is what we try and do. Like we try and build bridges into those environments. Um, so we take those in areas, and then what, what we were talking about earlier is enablement across architectures, which is also what we're happy to do. And if you have payload that you want to bring out into different areas, you don't have to look for the hardware. You don't have to look for the enablement side of things. Just come, come and consume what we're doing, right? So this is a reasonably complex picture, which most projects don't want their user stories to look like, right? If you have to start a user off at that end and then explain this whole thing to them before they can get to your software, that's a bit of a problem, right? But what happens is as a project, as a technical project doing development work, this sort of a process makes your life easier for the user story because the user story really just starts here at the bottom, right? Bec because before that is all stuff that you would own. You would own your builds, you would own the testing, you would own the release cadence and all of that kind of stuff. So all of this stuff, right? What, did, what does it look like to a user? It basically gets summarized into one simple pipeline, which is you have an input, which is from Git, and then you get stuff out of the pipe at the other end. And effectively, your exposure to the user base gets limited to exactly that, that you have your Git repositories with your content in, and what you get out at the other end is packages that have had the benefit of going through this particular process where you can cherry pick that, hey, I want this, 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 I want to test this, 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 I don't want to test this, this, this. And that is the big, that is, and, and, and in many ways, that's a big value proposition of working within the CentOS ecosystem, engaging with the user space, right? That you can summarize that entire technical setup, right? That entire background of what happens, the entire factory, as it were, on what happens to software from one end to the other end to, hey, I have a Git repository on one end, and then you get consumable stuff at the other end. Does that kind of make sense? So then again, going now, I, I'm just going to go back to where we started from, right? There, there are four key tenants to a good or a relevant um, open source, or well, we're not talking about open source anymore, right? To a software process that produces projects. The first part of it is key, right? You have to have, or you should really have software that is useful. If you don't have software that is useful, then that could be a bit of a problem, right? Because nobody's going to want to use it. So let's, let's assume that people have software that, people want, that other people want to use. Um, the second part of it, the second layer of the onion, is that you want a responsive maintainership. You want a responsive group of people who are going to maintain the relationships, who are going to maintain the software, who are going to be responsive to bug reports, who are going to be responsive to requests, and things like that, right? The third layer of the onion is that you want confidence. You want community-driven confidence, that the community should know that if they're investing on top of your, um, uh, on top of your layers, and that could be either they're using a library that you create, it could be, you know, somebody running his business on the email server that you wrote, 
or whatever, right? So when they invest on your product or your process, they should be a reasonable level of confidence that there is continuity. And I think that's a key part that a lot of people often miss, right? And then the fourth part of it is that you want a great user engagement story. And, and this is the part that CentOS can really help you in, is to build a really comprehensive infrastructure that you guys can then consume without having to own any of this debt, right? Uh, as, as, a single, as a single example, right? How many people here know what Jenkins is? How many of you have suffered the pains of Jenkins? How would you like us to just take that away and run Jenkins for you so you can focus on the code? And I think that's, that's one of the key tenets here, right? So what we're doing is we're running this infrastructure for you. And even simple things like when a test fails, you want there to be confidence, right? That the test failed because of a code issue. You don't want the test to fail because, hey, one hard disk fell off, or you know, the network switch was down between two machines, or the Git checkout timed out, and things like that. And for us, that is the confidence that we build into the user base that is the upstream projects. And, and that's what we're basically trying to get to. So basically, take this, assume the complexity of running all of this stuff, make it simple for you guys to do your job, which is all of the arrows in the middle in there. And as far as the users are concerned, it allows you to build all of your relationships at the end, which is, you know, hey, here's the content, go consume it. That could be good or bad. Nobody has anything to say. Right. <laughs> We have, we have, I think about, s Brian is at the back there. There's about 76 projects that are in this, in various stages of evolution. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, let's not use the word use, let's use the word abuse. The people who abuse it the most um, are, are the OpenStack upstream projects and RDO. And then uh, there are projects like um, James um, Purple Idea was doing his talk about management config. <coughs> Sorry. I have a sip of water. Open it. Yeah. yeah, so the second person who, who's kind of abusing it quite a bit is the is is James Shubin, who's doing this management config um, software piece that is completely built and delivered and tested on on our pipeline. And he's going pretty much across the board. Um, the only thing that he's not doing with us is the sources, you know, the bit of the gray, the dev part of it that he's got on GitHub. And that's fine because you can enter this process at any point you want. You can choose to just use RCI, you can choose just to use the source to binary build services, or you can choose to use both. You can choose to test on whichever environment you want and you can choose to go to whatever architecture, whatever platforms you want, whatever vendors you want. What you can't, however, do is bring your artifacts in after the blue stage. So you can't say, hey, here's my process, here's my project, go publish it on Amazon like, you know, all the best. So you have to, so as long as you're involved with some part of the process, then uh, then you can go through with it. I think the software collections guys are doing quite a bit of the process as well, um, where, 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 again, they're doing the source elsewhere, but they're building with us. Um, they're doing a little bit of testing with us, um, but there is there is CI there, and then we, they're delivering through RCDN, at the moment only for x86-64, I believe. Um, but there are there are a couple of people who want to do it for PowerPC, and I know there's at least a couple of guys who've been asking about um, some of these components, like the l uh, the newer LAMP stack for the Raspberry Pi, for the V 7 But there are, th I mean, so the pieces individually all come together, um, and the different people who are consuming it at different scales. Does that can kind of answer your question? Yeah. Is there anything else anybody wants to bring up or talk about? Alan, hi. Uh, so the question is, how do you do user metrics? We don't actually do a lot of user metrics because it's hard for us to do metrics. Um, I'm guessing what you're talking about is downloads, right? Um, so the way the CentOS CDN is set up, most of the people, most of the users would get their content from local mirrors. They won't actually get it from a machine that we run, um, which makes it really hard to track stuff. There are a few things that we do track though. For example, for the CentOS deliveries that we push into Amazon, right? Um, anybody who hits a yum update will hit mirrorlist.centos.org, which is on our infrastructure. And then we can track where they came from and then send them to a mirror which is local into their availability zone so that the users don't end up paying for transit bandwidth. 
to do YAM updates and stuff like that. So we can get some numbers around those, which is, which is again, very vendor specific. Um, and the other place where we do have a lot of metrics is IPv6 versus IPv4, and we can do density and things like that. But in terms of how many people actually did a download, we would, we would have to figure that out on a project by project basis. I mean, like for, for OpenStack, a, 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 a relevant question might be that, A, how many people are downloading OpenStack from CentOS, right? And then a second question might be the ones who do, what all components of OpenStack are they actually using? Because it's possible you guys are spending all your time packaging two pieces that nobody uses. And, and that's hard. That's hard to do unless we build something into like an installer or something like that. I, I guess the, sh the short version, the short answer to your question is that we don't do any metrics at the moment. But if there was a compelling case to do those metrics, we'd be happy to work with you to build something up. Well, if there's nothing else, then thank you very much for listening to me. Oh, there is another question. No, I mean, I don't, I don't say that open source is one. Right. I think so if you go back. Right. I think so. I'd, I'd say that if you went back to 1999, doing open source meant that you were that one guy in, a, in the conference who, who knew what it was, right? And then, God forbid, you ask a licensing question, then you'd be like, I know there are three people in Northern America who can probably explain this to you. And I think that, that paradigm has switched, has changed quite a bit. And I think it's uh, open source as a, as a software process is no longer considered disruptive. It's actually become mainstream enough. I'll give you, I'll give you a tangible example, right? Across the world, 97, 98, 99, you could organize a Linux user group meeting, right? You could order pizza, you'd get beer, people would bring their machines, and you'd have install fests. You'd figure out, right, you know, this CD-ROM drive, this 2X Sony CD-ROM drive, let's see if we can get a driver built for it. And I don't know, I've been there, I don't know how many of you have been there, but increasingly, you'll find that it is no longer viable, it's no longer productive to actually have a Linux user group meeting anymore. But you can have software meetups. You can, and you will see PHP specific meetups. You'll see, you know, you'll see web engineering stuff coming up. You'll see even, you know, um, agile tools for agile practices, and and what they're talking about, the tools they're talking about are all open source. So I think I think that is the bit which has switched a bit. That you know, open source is no longer considered to be this strange beast in the corner. Um, which is why, again, I I, th I think in in many ways, rather than talking about it as software, I think of it more as process. Um, and and the idea that you can have collaborative software engineering, right, in, in a medium where people who have access to the software is beyond just the developers and the product managers itself. I think that idea is, is catching on um, fairly well. I have, I have friends and family who work for Microsoft as well, and even those guys have changed, you know, development processes to a point where they may not go to public uh, spaces, but the way they work is still sort of, you know, semi-community driven. This, this is, a, I mean, I would love to see open source win. I think there's a lot of miles to go before we get there. Um, but my thing is that I don't think it's, it's, it's anymore, you know, the strange, freaky, crazy guy in the corner kind of thing. Ooh, apparently we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.
ten trik asi je v tom, že tady to vlastně je potřeba, se to nedotýkalo. Zkuste si to, zkuste si to. Dejte si to do kapsy. Šoupnou to prostě takhle. Hmm. Zkouška, zkouška. Zkuste tam jakoby chodit. So, trying the mic, trying the mic, trying the mic, and suddenly it's working. Come on. Yeah. So, yeah, still working, still working. Oh, this is pretty awesome. Hmm? Yeah, well, yeah, it's working. Jo, jako já myslím, že to je v pohodě. Jasně, jasně. Filipe, taky jo, to znamená, když to dávají, dobrý na tu šmíru. 